Well, this video is most assuredly RTX on. So the RTX is upon us. We're a little bit, I just, uh, I don't make excuses, but so we pre-ordered some RTX 2080s on launch day. And uh, the one that ordered directly from NVIDIA didn't ship until October 5th. Oh well. And the one that we got from Newegg, funny story, uh, Newegg had their credit cards stolen, including the credit card that we entered to buy the card. So the order was canceled and it didn't really work out. But I got this Gigabyte RTX 2080 Ti instead from, you know, a subsequent later order, which also came October 5th. So I guess pre-order doesn't really matter because they both came the same day. I don't know. The GeForce RTX 2080 Ti is heralded by some in the media as a, you know, such a revolutionary product that you don't really even need to test it. You could just say, oh, it's revolutionary. The competition doesn't have anything. Fastest card ever, blah, blah, blah. I've taken a look at the 2080 Ti, the 2080 and the 2070. I, right now, I don't find the 2080 to be a compelling product because the 2080 is basically on the same performance tier as the 1080 Ti. I mean, Nvidia has very carefully tuned the 2080 to basically be the same as the 1080 Ti, except for, of course, you get, you know, tensor cores, ray tracing, that kind of thing. But there aren't really any games that will take advantage of it yet. So I don't see the advantage of paying more, especially when you can get a 1080 Ti for, you know, 550, 600, you know, from a used perspective on a used market, maybe less than 500. I mean, I've, I've picked up some 1070s for under $300 just because, I mean, that's a good deal. A 1070 is a great gaming card. The 2080 Ti, however, is head and shoulders above the 1080 Ti, and it's got the price to match. And a lot of that, I think, is because of the supply of 1080 Ti's. Nvidia doesn't want to eat a loss in the 1080 Ti's, so they kind of want to have their cake and eat it too. And the RTX 2080 Ti is priced accordingly. Now, part of that might be GDDR6 costs, and part of that might be the enormous die size of the RTX 2080. But why the Gigabyte? Why the Gigabyte RTX 2080 Ti? And I'll tell you, these cards NVIDIA is controlling more than they usually do in terms of like AIB board partners like Gigabyte, Aorus, you know, whatever. Um, in terms of like controlling the overclock and the out of the box and that, that sort of thing. At least it's my impression that NVIDIA is exerting more control than they usually do. And so, you know, this is a two slot card, has two eight pin power connectors. A good deal of the wattage there is actually for the built-in USB-C connector for the upcoming USB-C VR headset so you can get power and high-speed graphics over one connector. That's great, although if somebody trips over a cord, that connector is so small, you better believe it's gonna destroy both the graphics card and the cable. So hopefully there's gonna be quick release. You remember the old Xbox controllers, the quick release? I'm on, I'm, focus, focus, focus. Out of the box, this thing is 300 watts for the GPU. Out of the box, this thing is 266 watts for the GPU. Gigabyte has very kindly provided an updated BIOS that will unlock voltage modes up to 366 watts for the 2080 Ti. And it shows, and it shows in the performance benchmarks and all this other kind of stuff, but let's unbox first. So this is the Founders Edition. 2080 Ti. And one other thing I should point out on Nvidia's website, it lists the Founders Edition 2080 Ti as having more um, more tensor core, more like more RTX cores or something. And it's just regular 2080 Ti like this has less. I'm not really sure what that's about yet. Curiously, on the box, in terms of like hard specs like that, you don't really have much. It's 11 gig. But in terms of like actual other specs, you know, GDDR6, 352-bit, HDMI, DisplayPort, 11 gig, you know. How many, you know, RTX thingies am I getting? How much, how many tensor cores am I getting? And it's not on the box. You won't, you won't find it on the box. It's not, it's not anywhere to be found and I'm not sure why. It just has ray tracing, GDR6, DirectX 12, Ansel, 2080 Ti. There's more information, there's more specs on the NVIDIA website. Why? Why is it like this? Anyway, now this card is a hefty card with a lot of cooling. I can see that there's copper heat pipes here, tons of thermal pads. There's even thermal pads between the metal back plate and the rest of the PCB so that the back plate could be used for some additional heat dissipation. In terms of rear connectors at the back, we've got one HDMI, 
We've got three DisplayPort, and this is a newer revision of DisplayPort that's even higher bandwidth. And then of course we've got USB-C. Now this USB-C port will carry video and connections to VR headsets and power. So you've got USB-C power delivery. Don't try to charge your laptop off of your graphics card. Although I guess theoretically you could if your laptop is around what, 65 watts, give or take? But don't do that, that's silly, don't do that. Now even though this is a two and a half slot card, it's not a tall two and a half slot card. And I have a feeling that that is compatibility for external enclosures and compatibility for systems that don't provide a lot of a lot of headroom on top of the card. But it is a three fan card. It's got gigabytes, you know, sort of innovative three fan design that has been featured on previous fans, except for this fan spins the opposite direction. I'll just be honest. The Founders Edition card feels like a brick. I mean, you pick it up and it feels like it's one solid piece of insanity. The Gigabyte card is not far behind. I don't know that I would wanna ship a system with either one of these installed because there is a lot of weight here. I mean, you've got the huge die and the, 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 uh, you know, the VRMs and everything else that needs a lot of cooling on this card. And this thing has a beefy heat sink as a result. I mean, you can really see the fins on this and the copper heat pipes. If you uh, ship your system around, definitely take the graphics card out and ship that separately or mount it separately because there's a lot of Potentially there is a lot of weight here that would be flexing on your motherboard in terms of like, you know, delivery, UPS, that kind of thing. All right, so brass tacks, what are we looking at? First, noise. In terms of noise, the Gigabyte card beats the Founders Edition card hands down in terms of noise. The Founders Edition card, when you max out the fans, it definitely will sound like a vacuum cleaner. It does a pretty good job keeping the card cool, but the fans max out on the Gigabyte card also will be quite loud but not as loud as the vacuum cleaner, dual vacuum cleaner sound that you have on the RTX 2080 Ti. Now the cooling solution on the, the Founders Edition 2080 Ti is not bad. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm just saying that I think Gigabyte has done a better job and the thermals on this card are actually better. Messing around in Time Spy, Extreme, and Fire Strike, just with a totally stock system, I was able to get, I think, uh, I think as high as I was able to get was uh, eighth uh, eighth in the world with an AMD system and I was a little bit farther down with an Intel system So for the the testing we used a couple of different systems We used the 8086k running at 5 gigahertz with 16 gigabytes of G-Skill memory running at 3600 So the, the timings on those are a little loose because 3600 is designed for for Intel systems But 3600 is also clocked pretty high. So 8086k 5 gigahertz in our testing on the Intel platform, this is probably the first card that I've run into where I'm going to caution against maybe if you have a quad core CPU using this graphics card, especially at lower resolutions. A four cores does seem like it struggles a bit keeping this card fed. Really, this card is designed for 4K. 1080p, I don't think makes any sense with this card. Now, I know ray tracing, you enter ray tracing and Nvidia did the demos of, you know, like Tomb Raider running with RTX and they were running it at 1080p and it couldn't manage 60 FPS. I'm gonna reserve all of that for another video in the future. Maybe if you're super into RTX, 1080p would make sense with a card like this. But for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that your money is probably better spent on a second generation card that is probably gonna be a better deal and is probably not dealing with the aftermath of the mining situation and the overstock of the 10 series cards, and we've got tariff stuff going on, at least in the US. So I don't think this card is a particularly good deal for gamers. And the performance sort of shows that. I mean, if you look at the performance of this and you wanna run 4K, this is the card to do it. So it's a premium experience card. I think that also the 1070, it's worth mentioning that the, or the 2070, the 2070 may also be an interesting card. I'm, I'm tempted, based on the performance of this and other information that I've seen online, the 2070 is gonna be worth looking at, I think. So I'm gonna to try to get my hands on a 2070 and see how that performs and, and works and, and, and does all that. But in terms of like the fluid 4K gaming experience, this card delivers a fluid 4K gaming experience in a way that even the super overclocked 20, 1080 Ti's uh, did not. Now, in terms of all of the other functionality, don't know, not sure yet. In terms of other off-label uses, in terms of like Linux, there is day one Linux support for this GPU. If you want to run this Linux, this, this card on Linux, this is about the fastest GPU that you can get for Linux. Now the Linux performance still lags behind the Windows performance, but Steam and all of the stuff that goes with that basically is okay. If that's your thing, you should check out the level one Linux channel because we're gonna do some separate stuff with Linux on the Linux channel. Now, what about those 
you know, tensor cores and tensor flow and machine learning and things like that. That's where we're gonna change my tune a little bit. This card's actually a really good deal. I mean, if you look at it as like Titan V, like the Titan V card, I'm reluctant to admit, but if you're into machine learning and, you know, scientific computation and things other than gaming, certain types of even multimedia workloads, the Titan V honestly is not a bad deal at around three grand. This has similar performance to a Titan V in a lot of scenarios. You get the 11 gigs of GDDR6, and there's some things that are not quite the same as the, as the Titan V. NVIDIA's gotta be careful not to cannibalize the, their markets. I can't wait for the Titan V version of this to be a thing, maybe. I'm not really sure how that's gonna take shape, but this is a really tremendous value if the Titan V was a pretty good value before in the terms of machine learning and cats per second and all of the stuff with, with uh, TensorFlow. Now, I think EVGA pioneered the utility of like you click a button and it overclocks your graphics card. Well, that's built in like, pretty much to everything now. NVIDIA has decided that that functionality should be available in all of these RTX cards. So it's built into the software and with the Gigabyte Utility, you can one click and it will find the perfect overclock for your system. With that, I was able to achieve over 9,000 in Firestrike Ultra, the 3D Mark benchmark program. And that actually put me in like the top 100 on the website, which is you know, pretty impressive. Now compared to the Founders Edition card, I was never able to achieve over 9,000 on the Fo Founders Edition card. I could get close. It was like 8,700, 8,500, something like that. But the bone stock configuration, the 2080 Ti Founders Edition just on default settings, it was around 8,000. So it's about a thousand point increase on the Firestrike Ultra benchmark. Not too shabby. Now the other test system, other than the five gigahertz 8086K, is a Threadripper 2950X with PBO and, and all the fixings, 2933 memory. It's a pretty high end gaming system. And the question may be, will Ryzen, will Threadripper bottleneck the 2080 Ti? Because there are performance anomalies, especially at lower resolutions and high frame rates, on the Threadripper platform. And that's just because of platform differences and the fact that you might have some local memory or some far away memory. And, and so there's just, there's gonna be some performance differences. Our benchmarks show that basically at 1440p and 4K, it's a wash. Uh, even with the five gigahertz, you know, the six score, the six score has a little bit of trouble in some games keeping this monster fed, but the, you know, the 2950X really doesn't. Uh, you can use utilities like Process Lasso or Task Manager to set the affinity. Pretty soon you're gonna be able to use dynamic local mode from the uh, Ryzen Master software on Threadripper CPUs that's coming out at the end of October. And that'll probably also help performance in games. I mean, they, they show in their graph, you know, Battlefield 1 is gonna be 40% faster on the 2990. Not that you should ever use the 2990 for gaming, but it should be faster. Uh, with the 2950 as well, just because you can run your graphics card and the game on the Ryzen die that is that it's actually attached to. So one of your Ryzen dies handles half of your PCI Express lanes and the other Ryzen die handles the other half of the PCI Express lanes. So if you can put your game on the Ryzen die, the eight core Ryzen die, that handles both the graphics card and the memory where your program is running, well, the system I've got other videos on that you should check out, but basically if the operating system is a little bit smart, it can put the busy threads on the processor that is most local to both the graphics card and the memory. And you will get a performance benefit from that. And dynamic local mode is going to do some of that in software while we're waiting on Microsoft to sort of catch up. And so with games like GTA 5, I'm able to just do it with GTA 5 and it's totally fine and you will get a little bit of a performance bump. That said, the Intel CPUs, uh, in terms of like absolute maximum performance, squeezing out of this card, you get that on the Intel platform, but as you go up to 1440p and 4K, it's a wash. Uh, the, the differences turn to margin of error, basically, uh, and it varies a little bit from game to game. Like one game may be more optimized for an Intel CPU than another, but that's not really down to the GPU. So please keep that in mind when you're looking at those reviews. If there are any specific anomalies, that you guys would like me to investigate, I've got the hardware, let's have a discussion. I can do the deep dive. We can take that, we, we could take the game down to the bare assembler if we have to, and I would be glad to do it. Let's figure it out. I've done it with GTA 5, GTA 5 is no longer interesting. Let's find another game like that that I can take apart and see exactly how it works, because that's the one that we figured out that GTA 5 actually falls apart at 140 FPS, and that's why it was a better experience on Ryzen than it was on the Intel, because the, the Intel system was 
going so fast the engine was falling apart, like stuff was coming off of the car, too many car, too many RPMs. But if you had a, uh, effectively, the Ryzen platform at 1080p had a performance governor. And so you had a better, smoother experience on the Ryzen platform. There are also positive contributing factors. The fact that one process won't starve all of the cache memory on the CPU because the cache memory is split up. That also helps Ryzen as it turns out. So, eh responsiveness and I'm getting way off topic here. RTX 2080, is it a buy or is it a don't buy? If it's just purely for gaming, it better be worth it to you to spend over a thousand dollars on a graphics card for that 4K gaming experience. If it was me personally, I would wait for a second gen product. I would probably pick up a 1070 on fire sale from like a miner or a 1080 Ti if I had to have, you know, 4K and I'd probably be satisfied with, with 1440p at a ridiculous FPS for like Twitch shooters. And then for games like Skyrim, I mean, obviously Skyrim's not de demanding, but for games that don't depend on Twitch-like reflexes, I would be happy with my, you know, 45, 50 FPS at 4K um, from the 1080 Ti, knowing that I saved 700 plus dollars. That's my two cents. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you in the level one text forums. Let's come hang out. Let's figure out some projects, some cool stuff we can do with these. I didn't get an SLI bridge because $70. But I'll probably do that. I'll probably have done that by the time this video comes out. So I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.